I'm sure you've noticed with the way Shield Hero is currently going that there's quite a bit happening but not a lot of explanation. There's new characters appearing left, right, and center, then major story elements that are being rushed through like they're nothing. So, as much as I'd like to do an in-depth cut content on the core chapters we've seen this episode, I think it's best to go back and provide more of the much-needed context on how we got here. That way, certain topics like the hero's disappearances, as well as new characters like Eclair and the Old Lady will make more sense to you. So, instead of this being cut content for episode 27, consider this more like an episode 25.5. In any new special to bring you up to speed with the vast progress made between Season 1 and Season 2. Then next week I'll do a combined cut content for Episodes 27 and 28. Now, before we get started, it's important to note that all this does take place before the Spirit Tortoise had even been identified. Yes, there were incidents of mysterious monsters attacking villages around the globe, but no one had yet been able to deduce that these were the Spirit Tortoise's familiars which places everything I'm about to talk about chronologically before anything we've seen in Season 2 so far. So, if we start from where we left off last cut content, it wasn't long after Kiel and Ratio were made Naofumi's slaves that we were introduced to the female knight that we see here. The daughter of the noble who once governed Raftalia's village, as well as the queen-appointed teacher for the hero's training exercises. Unlike how we were initially led to believe, though. It turns out that the former nobles of Raftalia's village weren't all killed after all. Yes, their talented lineage of knights was heavily damaged during the waves, but not all were killed like how Nafumi thought they were. Instead, many had used the chaos to hunt down the demi-human survivors and sell them off as slaves. That being the case, Eclair saw it necessary to find those traitors and bring them to justice. She felt it was her responsibility to capture the knights who betrayed their own people, thus the reason she hadn't appeared in the story until now. It was only after the end of the Kalmira arc that she'd finally been able to capture the last of them and return back to the Queen, resulting in her being chosen to train the heroes now. As for her qualifications, well, aside from being the winner of the National Fencing Tourney, the only people stronger than her were either dead, imprisoned, or demoted, making her the most suitable person in the entire kingdom to make the heroes stronger. Now, I won't go too deep into the actual events of the training, but you should know that despite it being for all the heroes to get stronger together, Naofumi's party was the only one to really take it seriously. The other three didn't even attempt to show up for the first few days of it. As for what this training was meant to teach, well, aside from making them more proficient in battle operations, the main goal was to learn a style of combat called the Hengen Muso style, a secret form of fighting created with the purpose of granting its users power similar to that of the heroes. That's not to say a master of it would be capable of fighting against a well-trained hero, but the Hengen Muso style does even the playing field a bit. It provides regular people with the power to fight against enemies that normally only the heroes would be able to. So that and the person teaching it would be the main focus for several chapters of this mini training arc. If the appearance of this old lady seemed out of place to you, well, that's because she's the other teacher the queen had hired to train the heroes the last living practitioner of the Hangin Muso style, and the only one capable of teaching anyone how to use it. When it comes to how strong she actually is though, you'd be surprised to know she's actually 20 levels higher than Naofumi. She was only 5 levels away from the level cap of 100. Of course, there did exist a class-up ceremony which allowed you to progress past that, but unfortunately that was a process which was forgotten many long years ago. So, unless Naofumi was able to rediscover how that legendary ceremony was once performed, him and his party were getting rather close to their max potential. In any case, that's just the beginning of where this training arc is leading us. It's once the other heroes join a little bit later though that we really start to get some useful insight into how they think and why they act the way they do sometimes. Especially Ren and his attempt at making himself the most hated hero out of all of them. Since I'm still not convinced the anime would completely skip out on all of this though, we're just gonna fast forward a bit to when the other heroes began to show their true colors. It was after only a week of what was likely grueling hardships to the three of them that each had decided to abandon their training completely, much to the point that they were attempting to flee the country to do so. Rather than accept the fact that they were much less stronger than they thought themselves to be, they instead chose to avoid the thought and run away from it, leaving now Fumi and the Queen no choice but to confront them before they could. Of course, the typical excuses came up over and over again, but the main one they kept coming back to was now Fumi. Not only was he a cheater they felt they could no longer stand to be anywhere near, but they also believed he was using the training to punish them for the way they treated him before. It was far easier to pin the blame on Naofumi than simply accept the fact that they didn't want to put the effort in to become stronger. 
leading them to the extreme measures they were taking now. That said, this wasn't something the Queen was willing to let happen by any means. As someone who had foreseen this as a potential outcome, she had taken the necessary measures to make leaving Malremark as difficult as possible. Not only were the border guards ordered to not let the heroes pass, but any guild in any country with relations to Malremark had already been told not to issue any quest to them. So, if the heroes did still somehow manage to leave the country, unless they went to a new one both diplomatically and geographically removed from Malremark, the only thing awaiting them would be death. It was a necessary action that had backed the other heroes into a pretty isolated corner, eventually leading them to escalate matters in a way I personally never would have expected. With nowhere else to turn, the other heroes began to raise their weapons as if to fight, pointing them at the queen as if to try and scare her. This wasn't something the queen was really bothered by, but the very intent to do so had showed just how desperate they were. They were quite literally moments away from passing the point of no return. Fortunately for them, the queen was more than generous enough to provide an out for them, an offer of freedom in exchange for two very simple tasks. If they could eradicate some mysterious monsters plaguing the country, as well as participate in stopping the next wave in about a week, then after that the queen would let them do whatever they wanted. It was an offer they couldn't refuse no matter how much they wanted to. So, with no choice but to accept, the other heroes reluctantly left to earn their freedom, bringing an end to a scene I really hoped would be in the anime. Of course, there was plenty more to it that added to the intensity, but in the off chance that it does somehow appear later, I'll keep the more riveting details for a later episode. The main thing that does need to be taken away from this though is that this was how the heroes ended up missing in episode 1. They were sent to investigate these mysterious monsters, but instead fled to the east and couldn't be found after that. Initially, they were rather responsive during their first few days of investigations, but whenever it came time to discuss what they had found, it always appeared as if they were hiding something. Their nonchalant attitude had made it clear that there had to be something. Then, after the third day of hunting whatever these monsters were, the news had arrived of the other hero's inevitable escape. Well, that may not have been their intent, but apparently they had broken through the borders under the pretense that they were going to stop the monsters. A bold move that pretty much confirmed Nafumi's suspicions. Whatever the other three heroes were traveling east to do, it clearly had some relation to the information that they were hiding from him. Information they were seemingly willing to make themselves enemies of the state for. As for what their true intentions really were, well, that was something only Vittoria knew. You see, now Fumi had tried to contact her to get her help in catching them, but her ability to teleport didn't extend to the country that they were heading to. She did mention how she knew what they were up to, but she didn't really elaborate beyond the implication that they were supposedly attempting to end the waves for good. It was a plan that strayed from the path Victoria had intended for them. A plan that would force Naofumi to have to make his world-changing decision sooner than later. I don't know if you remember from back in Season 1, but Victoria had mentioned how there would come a time when Naofumi would have to choose between the world or the people. He could either cooperate with the heroes and try to save everyone, or do things solo and save the world instead. A choice in which the latter always required significant sacrifice. Yes, the world would be saved and now Fumi wouldn't have to rely on anyone, but the cost that came with it was a great deal of life. Potentially even all life. So, with the heroes going rogue and putting themselves at risk, the choice to save the people was getting ever more distant. Thus the reason now Fumi would decide to chase after them. He would rather put aside his differences and deal with their arrogance than be responsible for what's essentially an apocalyptic situation. But yeah. That's pretty much everything that happened before we get to the spirit tortoise stuff. The heroes are missing for a far bigger reason than you can imagine, and their selfishness is starting to put a lot more at stake than just small villages. It's a whole subplot I really hope the anime plans to delve more into with the future episodes. If not, then you can always be sure to get that missing information here. So, if you did happen to enjoy this video, then be sure to let me know down in the comments, and feel free to sub so you know when the next one comes out next week. But anyway. As always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time, ciao!